He's in the category all his own as a vocalist, a versatile musician, hit songwriter, and he's a master behind the console in the recording studio. Gene Pitney is here with a career that began back in high school in Rockville, Connecticut, and took him to the top of the charts with tours the world over. He's worked with Phil Spector, Burt Backrack and Hal David, country artist George Jones, and the Rolling Stones. His first group was Gene Pitney and the Genials, and after studying electronic engineering, which later aided him on the technical side of studio work, he met up with Ginny Arnell. They became Jamie and Jane, and in 1959 released the single Classical Rock and Roll, backed with Strolling Through the Park. That was followed a year later with Cradle of My Arms under the name Billy Bryan. But it wasn't until he put out I Want to Love My Life Away for a cost of $30 that it all began for the 20-year-old. The Kalen twins put on vinyl his tune, Loneliness, while other Pitney compositions have been recorded by Steve Lawrence, Roy Orbison, and Bobby V, to name a few. And he scored in a big way when Rick Nelson recorded Gene's Hello, Mary Lou. Hello, Mary Lou. Hello, Mary Lou. Goodbye, Howard. Sweet Mary Lou, I'm so Later, the Crystals released the Pitney penned He's a Rebel in 1962, which ironically kept Gene's Only Love Can Break a Heart at number two on the Billboard chart. Both of those songs won BMI Millionaire Awards in 97 and 98, respectively, for performances over a million times in the United States. Every Breath I Take was produced by Phil Spector, and the classic hits flooded the radio airwaves. The man who shot Liberty Balance, Half Heaven, Half Heartache, Mecca, It Hurts to Be in Love, 24 Hours from Tulsa, I'm Gonna Be Strong, Looking Through the Eyes of Love, and the above mentioned Only Love Can Break a Heart is a short list. Town Without Pity was Gene's first top 20 and million selling single, which won a Golden Globe Award for Best Song in a Motion Picture and was nominated for an Oscar. In fact, he was the first pop artist invited to perform at the Academy Awards and he sang the tune. In the early 60s, Pitney recorded That Girl Belongs to Yesterday, written by Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, which became the duo's first song to make it on the U.S. charts. After that, Gene appeared on the Stones' first Decca album. Three years ago, Gene was featured in a CPTV PBS concert taped right here in Connecticut, and he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame last year. Performances for the Queen of England on stage at Carnegie Hall, sold out tours the world over, his life has been one most people can only imagine. And we're here to talk about all that. Gene Pitney, and welcome. Wow, Lich, thank you. <laughs> An impressive resume, I must tell I you. I didn't sir. realize I did all that. <laughs> I want to start with, first of all, congratulating you on the Hall of Fame last year, the Rock and Roll Hall thank of you. Fame. And I want you to tell me what that meant to you, being inducted. I want, to, I want to say, first of all, being a Connecticutite, that I've listened to you for years, and it's a pleasure to be here oh, with you. Pleasure. Thank you. Listen, that, coming from you, that means so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm oh, sorry, I missed the question. The induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. What did it mean to you, the honor, the privilege? Uh, when I was there and when it finally happened, I thought it was a wonderful thing to have. Looking out into the audience, which was full of um, all the people that had been the powers to be, in the record industry. You know, it's at the Waldorf Astoria and it's like 3,000 people, black tie, and it's a who's who of everybody in the music industry. At that point in time, I realized the, the importance of it. But before that, you know, I was nominated eight times. And I told them that night, I said, that means seven rejections here. <laughs> you know, guys, you know, come on. So I knew what the criteria was because I'm one of the people that actually votes uh, for the Hall of Fame. I don't know how that ever happened. They just started sending me ballots a long time ago. So I realized what the criteria was, and I knew that I fit the criteria, and I, I really thought that after a period of time that I would eventually get there. So it's, it's wonderful to have uh, that kind of a honor bestowed on you. That feeling must have been just overwhelming. It was great, and to, to be there on the stage and to have the wonderful Paul Schaefer band, I mean, what a set of musicians this guy has. I, I, I said that night they, they cut it on the VH1 coverage of the show, but I thanked them and said, boy, this is the band I want to take with me on the road. These are, <laughs> these are the guys. This is the A-team. Now, I don't want you to be humble. I really want you to be truthful, Mimi. Where do you put yourself in the flow, in the spectrum of rock history, when you think about you and your music? 
I think, to be honest, and this is right off the top of my head, that I wouldn't put myself anywhere in there because I've tried so many different things that I think you almost got to put me out here. I mean, I've had an awful lot of success, which I'm very, very proud of, but it hasn't been like a success of a certain type of song within a, a rock format. I'm more proud of the fact that I tried and was successful at the country and western, that I've recorded in a pile of languages and had great success, especially like in Italy. Uh, I've done R&B things. I've done folk LPs. And all, I think, at a pretty good quality level. So Absolutely. I think that I w would say that um, stick me out here somewhere alongside of all, all the other guys. But when you speak to your contribution to music and the way the people have embraced you and your music generation after generation, how would you speak to that? Hard to say. The only thing that I can say when people ask me, a lot of people say, you know, why are you still here after like 40 years of performing out there? And I try to explain to them how hard I work to try to keep what I do at the level that it's at. And that's the key to it. If I couldn't do what I do at the quality level that I do it at, I wouldn't do it anymore. Now tell me about that. Tell me about the, the goals that you set, the aspirations that you set in terms of the quality, the, the standard of, of excellence, the level of your quality. The shows that I do, the concert shows, we're forever working, when I say we, uh, primarily musically with my musical directors and uh, the content of the show. And then what I have to do with those vocals. You know, you have to realize that after all this time that there's a lot of people that come to a show and they sit out there and say, let's see if this guy can still cut it. You know, I know what the record sounded like. Can he still do it? Can he match that level? Yeah. Can he, yeah. I like to go out there and maybe think that right now I can do it better than I did when we were recording then. I actually think that as a performer and the uh, vocal quality that I have now, let's say in my maturity, I think has made it much, much better for me as a performer. But to get there, to get to be able to do that, a lot of it has to do with working out three or four times a week, which I do uh, on my own now, but for the last three or four years with a physical, uh, personal trainer. Well, you're in great shape. I meant to tell you that when we, when we first Thank met you. backstage. And I found out what was happening was that when I went to do the shows, the concerts, that aerobically and stamina wise, where at one time I could do a 45 minute show and end up huffing and puffing and sweating. Your endurance level. Oh, I was doing an hour and a half and breezing through it and loving it and really enjoying it and having no problem with any, <laughs> any effort part of it at all. So those are part of the ingredients that I think that bring it to the level of quality that we've got it to. The other thing is putting together a show that I try to keep more contemporary than just like an oldie show which I don't really want to do. I've been very lucky that the songs that you mentioned were all great songs that have stood the test of time. And I can do them on stage now, and they're not tired. They're still, they were crafted so well that they function really, really well with the great orchestrations that I have uh, backing me. But along with that, in doing those songs, we try to add things to it to make it diversified, the show itself. And I remember when I put in a, a song about, do you know who Robbie Williams is? Absolutely. Robbie Williams is a terrific performer, uh, primarily hugely successful all over the world other than the U.S. market. And he'll, he'll break it here one of these days. But he had a great song called Angels. I put it in the show about four years ago. And I was so surprised that people were dumbfounded that someone from my period of time, like considered being a 60s artist, was doing a contemporary song. And it worked so well, and it was right up my alley, and it's a great singable song to do on stage. Well, that's the kind of thing that I like to do. You know, you mentioned not wanting to be thought of just as a 60s artist. Right. So let's talk about that. What do you think the difference is between yourself and those singers who came up with you at the same time? I maybe work a little harder. I maybe go after it to stay more contemporary. I think that a lot of people get very content with what they did and allow themselves to do that. And I got nothing against that. If you're happy with that and you're content with it, that's wonderful. That's, that's the way to stay. But um, I still have that wanderlust thing of looking for that challenge of, of something a little bit different. And if I can grab it and make it a little bit better, I try to do that. You know, when people hear Gene Pitney, they know distinctively that's Gene Pitney. I mean, you stand alone. 
Having said that, is there anybody that you compare yourself to or identify yourself to? Not necessarily influences coming up, but somebody who you think you liken yourself to in terms of the way you approach the music, uh, the stage show. Hard to say, but I know one of the um one of the guys out there who keeps a very, very high standard is Paul Anka, who I think does that. Certainly. But I, I do want to jump back with when you said not necessarily somebody who influenced you, but I think the biggest influence on me musically of anyone is a guy that most people don't really know much about, but a guy named Clyde McFadder. Do you know who Clyde McFadder was? I don't believe so. It's a lover's question I'd like to know. <laughs> And seven days, seven days, I have held my life with you. And this guy had a way, almost like Chuck Berry, of being able to wrap words around his tongue and, and spit them out in a way that like nobody else could. And he really, really fractured me when I first heard him. Uh, and I used to try to sing very much like him. And I think that that gave me a little bit of the, uh, the background that I have for the kind of things that I've done. And your style. How did you develop it? Uh, I didn't. I, I don't have it. There's never been any development or any training or anything like that. Whenever I take a song, I sit down and try to get the most comfortable that I can with it in whatever my way is of singing it. And it's just something that that's the way I would do it. It's the only way I probably could do it. Gene, who do you think is somebody who has occupied a place in music that nobody else has? When you think of singers. Uh, wow, 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 very, very difficult question. Um, probably someone who stayed in their own area that no one else could touch because they were so unique in what they were doing. Um, like a Belafonte. I think a Harry Belafonte. That's interesting. This is own type of a thing, and no one really, uh, I do a couple of songs on acoustic guitar in, in my show, and I do them the way that he did it, because there, there is no other way to do the songs. He, they become a part of Harry Belafonte. Uh, 